I don't think it's a funny story at all, everybody. It's actually quite shocking. There, over my right shoulder, sits beautiful shadow. Andrew, I will allow you to tell the viewers how many times we drove past her within three feet? Two times. Two three times. times. Two or three times. We drove straight past that leopard. She is not two feet off the road. So I think she just had her head down, and my head was clearly in the clouds. Anyway, there she is. We're very, very happy to have found her. And you can see she's panting away. She's eaten something, I think a small impala. Somewhere around here. And I think we'll spend a bit of time with this leopard now. I haven't had a decent leopard sighting for some time now. And so we'll try and stay with her for the next little while. She's panting because it's hot. She's panting because she's eaten. I'm not sure what she's eaten, but we'll go and have a look just now and see if we can pick up what it is. And just to reiterate, we had a wonderful question this morning about my use of the term just now. In South Africa, that means in a little while. You can hear the thunder rolling now. A wonderful feeling. It won't be a wonderful feeling if it drops golf ball sized hailstones on us, of course, and it will be very sore, but I think that's very unlikely. Right, and I think that's little enough of the weather. Let's have a look at the letter of leopard. Yes, Karen, happy birthday to you again. You say that's why she's called Shadow. Um, well, yes, it's certainly one of the reasons she's called Shadow. Um, that's not an excuse for my general incompetence this afternoon, though. I feel most embarrassed that somebody had to tell me where she was. Very lovely she is, though. Now, Cloudscape from you 2 you say that there is a proverb from an ancient African game drive proverb that says it's better to see the log than to miss the leopard. Um, I think that that's a really wonderful saying. Thank you for that. Um, I think that I missed all... I did see a log that I thought was a leopard. Um, unfortunately, I did miss the leopard, but I take the meaning of what you say. A very good proverb. Thank you. We're just going to keep an eye on the lightning as it comes closer towards us. I've just got a feeling that this storm is a bit further away from us than we think it is. Although that said, Andrew, it does look like it's moving this way, doesn't it? Mm. <laughs> anyway, for those of you who don't know, while we just show you again the cloud, the leopard's not going anywhere. Um, this is a nine-year-old leopard. The name is Shadow, born to Karula, the Queen of Juma, who is 11 and a half. She'll be 12 in March. And she has so far, unfortunately, failed to raise any cubs to adulthood, except for one, which unfortunately had to be removed a little, bit while, a little while back. And he is now in rehab, as it were. Um, but for six litters, she's tried desperately to raise some babies but unfortunately has failed so far we don't really know why okay well she's not going anywhere scott's got something very special little balls of cotton wool running across the ground let's head across to him i'll stay right here with the leopard now look closely you're gonna get some glimpses of tiny tiny crested franklin there they are two four five of them it looks like with their proud parents and isn't that fascinating? Incredible camouflage, those little chicks around. If they need to disappear, all they need to do is drop flat and nothing will be able to see them. They can't fly, but they certainly can disappear very, very well with that camouflage. And I'm glad we got you that quick glimpse. And well done to James and all of you for eventually 
finding shadow. See you later. <laughs> Back again with the leopard. I hope you enjoyed the little cotton wools. I find that the uh, the little Franklins are two some of my most favourite favourite things to look at in the bush. Hear a couple of guinea fowl behind us going. It's normally an alarm call, but I don't think they can see shadow here. Well, I hope they can't. I'd be very embarrassed if the guinea fowl has outspotted me. And Pamela, I think you might be well right. She's lying in some very thick bush here, and you say she's probably waiting for the storm. I think you're correct. You know. I'm just going to help these other game drive vehicles get in here and have a look. She's quite difficult to see. We're basically in the best place. And I'm not sure that anyone else is going to be able to see her. Jen and Eric in Pittsburgh, I'm afraid I missed what you said, what your favourite expression now is. I was lost in trying to get these people into the sighting. And I'm so glad that you love the expression, see you just now, I do too. Although every time I say it, I do get a slight pang, because I know that nobody knows what on earth I'm talking about. I'm also glad that you watch it work. I think it's a much better idea than actually sitting in a board meeting, for example. And just to reiterate, everybody, this is a live safari, which means if you are watching and hearing questions, it's because people are asking them live so hashtag safari live if you want to ask us on twitter anything or questions at wildearth.tv if you want to ask on the email and we really do welcome and encourage you to talk to us tell us where you're from ask us anything you like about the area about what we do here about the animals the characters and we really do like to hear from you hashtag safari live on twitter or questions at wildearth.tv So if you've just joined us, this is Shadow, a nine-year-old female leopard, panting, panting, panting away, hot, and stomach is full. She's been eating something. I'm not sure exactly what it was. But we'll go and have a look just now. I suspect a little baby impala. What are you looking for? The carcass is in that tree down there somewhere. Is it in the tree? Yeah, somewhere in there. It's not a hoister, this lady, you remember that? <laughs> <laughs> now, one of the reasons we think that she's lost so many babies is that she hasn't, she doesn't hoist her kills very often, which means that they're always vulnerable. She's constantly having them filched by thieving hyenas. And that just means that her cubs are always going to be slightly unsafe. And Rich King, we're hearing from you regularly, which is wonderful. New viewer since Big Cat Week, as far as I can tell. Uh, Rich. Um, you're surprised that she's surrounded herself by so much foliage. No, Richard, it's perfectly normal for a leopard. It's why we struggle to see them, especially 
as you know the well I mean she's quite close to a very open area so she'll want to remain as hidden as possible and you can imagine if an impala came walking past here it would struggle to see her and she may well leap onto it and sometimes leopards actually keep caches of kills so or pantries they'll hoist one and keep it and let it uh, become ripe in the sun while she eats the other one first so this is actually the perfect perfect place for her to be shady cool and very hidden look at her just giving a little bit of a growl there and i think i'm going to just back off a little span of a healthy leopard out here it does vary but the oldest female we've ever seen in this area the reports of an 18 year old the oldest confirmed reports though are of a 17 year old leopard down at Londolosi and we know we knew her very well and then males there's a 15 year old male at the moment who's just died around again at Londos um, but that's you know often those you know those are the sort of records of regularly seen leopards there may be well be some that have lived longer but I'd say for the average age for female in this area 13 to 14 years average age for male probably mm, just younger than that maybe 12 or 13 years sometimes older than that and in captivity you'll live up to 20 but we've got a young we've got a male here at the moment called Mvula he's 11 pushing 12 and he's already starting to lose muscle mass he's starting to get skinny and I think you'll find that yeah 13 years maybe 14 is going to be the limit of his survival so I just backed off there everyone because she just gave a little bit of a, a growl she started uh, baring her teeth and that wasn't because you know I think she was a little bit upset with us I don't believe that there was any um, chance of her having a having a go at us at all but she was clearly saying I'm not comfortable here so it may be in the sound of my voice talking it may be that we were just too close I don't think it was that we were too close we've been that close to her before and I suspect rather than just you know then push it and make her move away uh, it was best for us just to reverse back a little bit. Hmm. Tammy, wonderful question. Of course, many new viewers, and you want to know about the names and why she might have a different, why she's named, and do we give certain animals names? What we do is we give the leopards names. Some places name them after their territory. Some places name them after the unique spot pattern that they have under their noses. And some people, some places will actually give them names like they do here. Um, she's called Shadow. I'm not actually sure why. But what happens is that either the male or the, either the ranger and tracker team who find uh, a new cub they will be able to name it when it becomes independent and likewise those who or sometimes um, the, you know, all of the ranging teams in the area get together and say well this is what we think we should call her now I don't know why she's called Shadow so any of our regular viewers who do know why she's called Shadow please let us know it would be fascinating to know and I suspect it's just quite a good leopard name really I think it's the most brilliant leopard name so Tammy then lions they won't name and the elephants they certainly won't name at all uh, lions they will name by pride and then sometimes they name the coalition members if they're sort of two males so we had two males here called them the timber males and one was called hairy belly and one was called ginger but that was just the 
our viewers that named them here that they weren't known by those names by the rangers here. in San Diego. Lovely to hear from you again. You want to know who found the leopard? The Arethusa guys found her this morning at some stage and then Ryan who's the head ranger at Arethusa came through here and pointed out where she was to me because I was driving around blundering about in the darkness. Hmm. Right, we're going to wait right here. Let's head across to Bifflesook Dam with Scott uh, he'll give you an update on the water situation and we'll stay right here. Welcome to the Buffalo Hook Waterhole. There doesn't appear to be a great deal going on here. But there's a lot more water in it after the recent rains, which is good news. And there are a couple of big old Cape Buffalo relaxing one in the water one out uh, if i was to choose who i would be i would be the one in the water i'm not sure what the one out the water is thinking it is a very muggy afternoon and they both doing what most four chambered animals or stomached animals will do during the heat of the day and that's chew the cud so they better busy better processing whatever food they have already fed on and I guess that could be a lesson for us as humans to chew our food a few more times before swallowing it just to make our digestive tracts job a little bit easier I know I am the worst culprit for wolfing down my food there's also two very pretty birds if we follow the water's edge towards us and they're scratching around looking for, I think, a few snacks. I don't think they're there for a drink. But they're looking for small little insects and grubs in amongst the mud and poop of all the animals that have come down to drink. This is a happy couple. They will have a nest somewhere, or possibly some chicks tucked away. They'll pair off for their breeding season. Who knows, maybe that's where they're running off to right now. Their chicks will look very similar to the chicks of the Franklin we saw a few moments ago. And Vanessa's just asked me about a specific nest that I've been following and how it's doing. Vanessa, there's been many different nests that I've been looking at over the last couple of weeks. So I'm not too sure which nest exactly you're talking about. So apologies. Um, but there are basically no current nests that are active that are providing us with any good information or good sightings. It could be the lilac breasted roller nest. That's the nest I was filming into. Those chicks have fledged and a squirrel now lives in their old home. So that's updates on the bird's nest. We need to find you some more and we're going to send you back to James right now. Sorry. We're back, everybody. She's moved. She's not happy, you know. I don't know what exactly why. We're a goodly distance from her. She did give us a little bearing of the teeth again there and I find that quite strange, I must say. So we're going to treat her with care. She's obviously feeling a little bit threatened by life. Perhaps by the noise. She's also going to go to the loo, which of course is an inelegant thing to do, but you know, it has to be done. Ah, oh, there we go, a deposit, well done. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Moustache, for your comment. And... Um, 
going to grace your comments about my moustache with a response, uh, but you say, how often do they have cubs? Um, if they're raising them successfully, Mr. Moustache, normally sort of every two and a half years, two and a half to three years, but she hasn't raised one successfully for the last little while. And so if they lose a cub, for example, like she has, they come into estrus almost immediately, and she will then produce another one. There is a kill in the tree, uh, which we also drove past twice. Wonderful, brilliant eyes that we have. With any luck, she's going to go up into the tree and start to feed. Yeah, and does that work for you? she goes, this is going to be fantastic. She's not known for hanging her kills in trees, but this one she has. So I take back what I said about her, although she doesn't always hoist. Wonderful golden light. Oh, there we go. Isn't that wonderful? Beautiful leopard silhouette. I am going to go a little bit forward just to see where she settles. Go. Look at that. Everyone. Isn't that wonderful? There we go. And I'll move forward as soon as that other vehicle is stopped. There we go. Let's go a little bit forward. like a little steam ball. It just bits of the dust. It's a fairly grim picture of its face. And do you tell me when you have a shot? because I'm actually speaking into the ear of um, the back seat of this vehicle in front of us and it's, it's slightly embarrassing. As, as per your comment earlier, Valerie, uh, you were saying you wonder if any of the guides feel a little bit silly talking basically to themselves when there are other guests around on safari. Yes, certainly sometimes we do feel rather silly. Sorry, it is. Mm. Mm. 
Street. Yeah, everyone that is a bag in parlor, sorry. Um, Right, so, Sammy, you wanted to know how high a lift can jump. Um, Sammy, I've seen them picking sort of a, a guinea fowl out of the air and leaping up to six or seven feet off the ground, so I mean, they can jump very high, um, probably much higher than that too if they really wanted to. And Paul Rizzo, you were saying that the leopards look like they climb so effortlessly. They do climb effortlessly. They don't often descend trees very effortlessly. They can be very kind of um, uh, slippery and slidey on their way down. But yes, they certainly go up total effortlessness. So just if you are watching this for the first time, it can be a very grim sort of sight for you to look at. Um, but, you know, leopards got to eat. And it's really just very special to see them in this kind of situation. It's a quintessential African shot. Tricia, you want to know in pounds per square inch what the bite force of a leopard is, and I'm afraid I don't know offhand. They are, it's pretty powerful. It's not as powerful as a hyenas. It's not as powerful as the jaguars. Um, probably roughly the same as a lion's, but no, I couldn't tell you for sure, I'm afraid, what the bite force of a leopard was, but we can have a look. Maybe somebody kind in the uh, final control would check it up for us. But I don't know exactly what the pounds per square inch is. It's amazing to watch this in the golden light with a storm sort of brewing behind us. Very lucky indeed. very good question of course that is not often asked but is sort of implicit in what we do. Lions, do lions ever climb trees? Um, Janet, yes they do. They are very inelegant descenders of trees, they're quite elegant on the way up. Uh, they don't often do it but they will climb and there's a reserve in East Africa called Lake Manyara where the lions are famed for climbing, climbing the trees and that's supposedly to stay out of the way of the flies. So yes, they absolutely do climb trees and they will also climb trees to scavenge from other predators. So, you know, if she hid this not too far from the ground in a branch that a lion felt it could balance on, the lion would definitely try and steal this kill. It is a baby in parlor and I tell you what confused me when we originally drove in here was the fact that it's, I think its nose has been crushed. I think that's how it was killed, which is not a normal sort of killing bite for a baby in parlor, but it did make the face look a little more squat, and that's why I mistook it. So there we go, very kind from Kirsten in the final control, 310 PSI is the bite force of a leopard. I think a leopard, I think a hyena is around 800 PSI, so that's, that's pretty huge. Ooh, a hyena is actually 1,100 PSI, so I mean you read different things about them, but at least three times the power in a leopard's bite.
it's almost impossible to conceive of those numbers. They're almost sort of uh, only useful for comparison because you can't conceive of that level of pressure. And then apparently a wild dog is also about 300 psi, which I think is pretty impressive uh, for a wild dog. I wouldn't have said that that was the case, but I learn something new every day. All right, while this leopard eats away at her impala, slightly grim-faced, let's go and see a living antelope with Scott quickly. We'll stay here in the golden light and keep you posted. Now, I've just noticed something, as I'm sure a lot of you have as well. This young kudu has got a lot of weeping from her right eye. I'm not too sure what that could be. Maybe there's just a grass seed stuck in there. Such pretty antelope, though. The kudu with their big ears. And we're not going to keep you here too long. We just thought we'd change your scenery quickly. But aren't you guys in great luck watching Shadow up a Maruda tree with the magical afternoon light that's bathing down on us? I must say I am quite jealous. So enjoy that, and we're going to keep searching for you. Okay. Three hundred. One thousand one hundred nineteen thousand. Oh, sorry. I. <laughs> Apparently, we are live. Again, I took my earpiece out to uh, talk to one of the guests on the vehicle here. Um, so here we go. Very good idea from Andrew to find out what a human being's bite pressure is. 150 psi, Andrew says. Uh, not Andrew says, Andrew's idea. Uh, so 150 for a human being. A leopard was about 350. We've got the hyena at 1,100, and a killer whale apparently sits at 19,000 psi. You don't want to be bitten by a killer whale. I don't think you'd uh, survive that. So, nice to be able to compare it. If you imagine your bite force, uh, leopard only about double that. I mean, I say only, but still not as much as you might yeah. think. starting to blow. Hello Brian, um, you want to know if animals are react differently when there's some big weather coming in? Do they know? Are they reliable indicators? Brian, I would say almost universally not very good indicators in this area. I haven't seen any um, change or obvious change in animal behavior. Um, save for that, you know, if there's a big wind coming in, animals will start to hide, but that's, you know, we would do the same thing. I don't think that they have necessarily a, a sense of barometric pressure. I think birds perhaps do, and I think frogs perhaps do. I don't believe the mammals behave very differently um, if they're expecting a storm. When the storm hits, then yes, obviously. And I think we're just going to stay right here, if that's all right with you. Isn't that wonderful to see everyone? I'll try and get a slightly better angle. Andrew's uh, twisted himself into the most incredible position to try and bring you this shot. Ellen, thank you very much for your information, one of our resident leopard fundies. Um, Ellen, you say that a, she was called Tingana when she was first born. Now, Tingana, of course, is already a male leopard around here called Tingana. Same age as her, actually. Um, and then when she took a territory on Arethusa, she became Shadow. So thank you very much for that. And Geoffrey, you reckon that's because she's so hard to track. 
Jeffrey, I think all leopards are hard to track. I think Shadow is just a brilliant name for a leopard. Look at the colour on that. That's perfect, Andrew. Hmm? Mm. bit of rain coming down but I mean as you can see there's blue sky above us so I think it's just blowing in off the front of that storm mm -hmm. now very difficult of course to balance the leopard on the tree I'd lift a kill on the tree. So, interesting question from Shell, and I think it's a very important one to address. Thank you, Shell. You, she gave us a little growl, or she bared her teeth at us earlier. You want to know if we hadn't moved, would she have become more aggressive? No, I don't believe so. I think she would have moved. She wasn't cornered, so, you know, if you corner a leopard, that's a different story, but she could, she could just easily have moved away, and a leopard will not choose to engage physically if she can. She'll say, go away, and if you don't, then normally she'll go away. The reason I moved was not because I felt like there was going to be an escalation of the situation where she might actually charge. It was simply because she was saying, you're making me uncomfortable, please move away. And, you know, that's, we have to oblige when that happens. The last thing you want to do is break the trust of these animals. So, Shell, very good question. Just about all animals here will move away rather than engage in some sort of physical contest. <laughs> oh, Olive and Emma, you're just five years old and you've asked a question. Is she bad because she doesn't have any cubs? Um, Olive and Emma, I th is she sad that she doesn't have any cubs? Olive and Emma, um, I think she was sad, you know, when she lost her cubs. Certainly there are lots of animals out here that do seem to... It's difficult for us to tell if they're sad or not, of course, because they can't speak and they don't cry, obviously, and their, you know, their faces are not like ours, where you can tell if by looking at your friend if she's sad or not. Same isn't the same for animals, but I think definitely animals do feel sad when they have loss. We know that elephants feel sad. Um, you've seen when your dog or your cat is happy or sad, and so I'm sure she was very sad when she lost her cubs. And hopefully she will have some more. She was mating earlier, so maybe she's pregnant and she will have another cub. <coughs> now, Eric, we've sort of chatted about this, but it, not really. Um, like I say, she had a cub, and he was a year old when he went off unfortunately into rehab after being exposed to rabies and um, he's so far fine as far as we know but we don't really know uh, other than that we don't know what's happening with him um, and Eric that was the longest that a cub has stayed with her normally they will go independent around 18 months to two years uh, uh, for in the case of female cubs Eight months is the oldest, is the youngest that a cub has ever become independent, which is really impressive. I mean, eight months is a little leopard, and incredible that a female should have become um, should have become independent at that age. And quite interesting, also, is that the um, that the males take a bit longer. It's quite astonishing that the males, well, I mean, a bit like human beings, take a bit longer to grow up. I'm just going to quickly ask about whether we can stay here for other people coming to the site or not, because I can't actually hear what's going on on the radio, and we may need to make some space. Remember, we didn't find her, so we, have, we might have to leave and make some space for other game drives. 
Sorry, everybody, I will get back to your questions now. I'm just trying desperately to find out what's going on here. Are there any stations still standing by for this sighting on the airstrip? I can make space. Okay, uh, we'll cover that somewhere when you get close. When you move out, I will get out. Sorry, everybody, we're going to have probably another 10 minutes with this level. Fantastic. Look at that, a rainbow and leopard all in one. <laughs> that's, that's just stunning. Oh, wow. Oh, it really doesn't get much better than that, everyone. Isn't that spectacular? She is captured in a glorious golden light. Just beautiful. Mm. <laughs> and Pamela, a very nice question from you on Twitter. I want to know if a killer has ever fallen into a vehicle. Not as far as I'm aware, Pamela. I've never had a kill in the vehicle. I think you'd have to be driving pretty badly and giving your guests a real crick in their necks yeah, if you were to park underneath the kill. I think, actually, I have had a bit of kill fall onto the bonnet before as I was driving underneath one. So, yes, it is possible. Oh, yeah. Hi guys. Hello. So I'm just saying hello to the other guides. It's important, of course, that we maintain a relationship with people. And like I say, we are going to have to pull out in about five or ten minutes. Fascinating question here that I haven't really thought about too much, Rich. Rich King, you want to know if the cats here, like house cats, might bury their feces? Rich, they don't really, you know. Um, certainly none of the big ones. I suspect maybe the caracal and serval do, but the, the big cats, no, not so much. And I think it's mainly because they're very effective territorial markers. You know, often cats will bury, or animals will bury dung in order to hide their presence. But the... Um, but the dung from these cats definitely helps them to mark their territories. watching the leopard in the tree. Uh, a few days ago I climbed a tree and 
showed you the traditional use of the leopard orchid, which is to chew the cane or the stick that the leaf comes on and uh, say the name of the one you want and she'll immediately start thinking of you. And Dr. Debbie, you want to know if I've heard from Scarlett Johansson yet? Uh, Debbie, I haven't. Uh, I think maybe it was because it wasn't during the full moon or 12 o'clock at night. Uh, so mm, we'll see. I'll try again on the full moon. Um, Eileen, you want to know <laughs> why dead animals always have their eyes open? Uh, they don't always, uh, but certainly sometimes they do. And I think it's mainly because that when they die, that they, you know, they aren't sort of asleep. If you know what I mean. So if they get killed and their eyes are shut, then they stay shut. Um, but normally, that animal is fighting for its life when it dies, and that's why the eyes are so open. Are they close by? Okay, I'm going to pull out. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, we're going to have to leave everybody. There is another vehicle coming in. Isn't that beautiful? All right, everyone, say goodbye to Shadow. Wonderful sighting we've had of her. And we'll see her hopefully later. Marvelous. No. Okay, Wow, what a wonderful sighting that was. I think let's drive along the airstrip and get a look at the storm. I think it's dissipating, you know, I don't think it's going to... Ooh, no, it's not. That's a monster. That's a big chap. Andrew, do you like the smell in the air now? The aroma of decaying impala flesh. Rain, yeah, mixed yeah. with rain, it really is very nice. And in Texas, there is a question of yours coming through. Um, I think it was read to me, then half deleted by somebody, and then I didn't hear it, but here it comes. Right, and fear not, here is your question. You want to know if leopards have their favorite trees or if they'll just use any tree that they can. Uh, and they don't really have a favorite, they're normally in marula trees. I think that's a function of the fact though that marula trees are good climbing trees. But if there are lots of jackalberries around, they'll happily climb those. Uh, they like on in some areas where there are mahogany trees, they'll climb those because they're good to sit in. So it's just got to do with the shape of the tree. Um, anything that's kind of decently shaped that they can climb up and hang something in, they will climb. I've seen them in knobthorn trees even, and I mean a knobthorn is a, is a profoundly a thorny and uncomfortable thing to be in. And it raises an interesting subject of um, whether or not leopards are in fact arboreal. Do they live in trees? They don't, you know. They are they're largely terrestrial. If they can avoid being in trees, they will. It's uncomfortable for them in trees. So, yeah, you just don't often find them sitting in trees, but for if they are trying to uh, hoist and stow their kills away from scavengers. All right, let's head across to Scott, and we'll see what he's got to show you. I think we'll probably head back towards Juma now and see you there. Very happy you have been spending some quality time with Shadow and James. And isn't it a beautiful evening? The rainbow, the dark clouds, some magical sunlight coming through. We are now approaching a very picturesque part of Juma, the major riverbed that flows through called the Mulwati. We should get some views of some beautiful big trees in that area. Not too 
beautiful things that we will not be looking at this afternoon are springbuck and gemsbuck. And Anne was interested to know if we got those two antelope here. We don't get them in the Sabi Sands, neither in the entire Kruger National Park. They prefer drier, more arid areas, typically around the central and western parts of South Africa. So sadly, not here. You do get Elant, another very nice antelope, the largest of all the African antelopes, but they occur further north in the Kruger National Park, so we don't get them here in the Sabi Sands. to hear that Gracie has shared her Santa list with us, a Santa safari wish list. And high up on her list are, most importantly, rain and food for all of the animals, and that's very kind and thoughtful of you, Gracie. She would also like sweets and toys for all of the Wild Earth Safari crew. That's us, very important. Thank you, Gracie, that you're looking after the animals as well as us. And then for you, last on the list, a safari barbie. And that is a great idea. I hope we can find you one. I'm not sure if Barbie likes coming on safari, but I'm sure Santa will be able to try and find you a safari barbie. I don't know if we're going to be able to get to this, but we'll have a try high up. Hey, up, Brian's warranted. High up in this leadwood tree, there is a woodland kingfisher letting off its shrill call. Let's see if it doesn't do it again. I'm sure there were two perched up there just a moment ago. It may have flown off its partner. They do form monogamous bonds. Gracie, I'm very happy you've shared your very thoughtful Santa list with us and I need to get mine written down soon and as soon as I've worked out what it is I think I should ask for I will be sure to let you know but I think I might actually just copy yours because your list is very nice that you're thinking about the animals first then other people and yourself last and if the rest of the world thought like that we'd be in a very good place so thank you gracie for teaching us all a very good lesson there when writing a wish list and nest sites and how desperate we are to try and follow the life of some chicks that are growing up. And Jacqueline has just asked me if I've ever seen a chick fledge for the first time, actually take flight for the first time. And I haven't, Jacqueline. I've never been able to monitor a bird's nest that closely. But with our current plans and intentions and the place we are, maybe we can all share a wonderful, wonderful experience like that. And we are all searching desperately for the perfect nest. I've even built that one nest that I'm hoping is gonna allow us easy monitoring. Good, well, it sounds like James has got up on some high ground and has got a wonderful view of the setting sun out to the west. Well, we just thought we had to show you this incredible storm that's brewing over to the west. It's not brewing, it's broken. It is now dumping its load on the Bushbuck Ridge area. Huge storm going on there. You can see the water pouring out of the sky. Isn't that a wonderful view? And you can also see how isolated it is. So, I mean, that's a... That's an area probably about 30 kilometers, 40 kilometers long that's getting that rain. If that, actually. 
and it would be very nice to have that here I must say I don't know that it's going to reach us the big black clouds are all around here I'm sure they're going on you know in various parts but just not on, over us at the moment but maybe later well, that is just stunning Thank you very much, Chantel, for your kind words. Oh, look at that lighting. Did you see it, Andrew? Yeah. Good way. job. Well done. Chantel, you say you loved that sighting and you were very grateful for it. Thank you. It's very easy, of course, to, to entertain people when you have a magnificent leopard like that and you say, what's my favorite big cat to spend time with? Well, unquestionably a leopard. Young males, especially, because they're so inquisitive, they're always moving around, and if you can find one on foot, that's just really, really special. But any leopard, Chantel, that would be my favorite big cat to spend time with. Thank you for watching. That's astonishing lightning. Huge storms, of course, up on the High Felt, which is basically the High Felt means highlands, and that's where Johannesburg is, and where I grew up, and where Andrew grew up. And we, get, we used to get storms there, what, Andrew, every, in the summer, almost every afternoon mm, correct. huge thunderheads would come rolling in and massive electrical storms there so if you from, happen to be from Johannesburg and these storms do come through it really is a uh, it's a profoundly wonderful feeling it's almost a homely feeling when you see the big storms coming I remember I lived in Cape Town for two years look at the lightning going there I lived in Cape Town for two years and the rain there tends not to storm like this it comes in sort of fronts and I remember once we had a we had a huge storm there one night and there was lightning and thunder and I got out of bed and went outside and just reveled in it because it was just such a, a tremendously powerful reminder of childhood I suppose so I just love the storms when they come through hmm. all right well that's the rain let's see if we can't spot something with a heartbeat you're you getting a lot of static hmm? not I've got entirely static oh, it's the game guy radio ok right got you now Jose uh, you're in Virginia I think I heard correctly and you would like to know uh, how many languages I speak and what language I was speaking just now. Um, I was speaking a language called Shangan or Shitsonga. You can use them sort of interchangeably in this area. Um, I don't speak it particularly well. I speak it passably though and I can get by. And it's the local language of this area and you want to know other languages that I speak. I speak very bad Afrikaans which is the other sort of um, well, a European derived language. It's not a European language anymore. It's very much an African language, but it's derived from a European language. It sounds very much like Dutch. And then the other language is my favorite one is called Isizulu, which is uh, the most widely spoken of our indigenous languages in South Africa. Beautiful language. And many people have heard the term Zulu and have heard of the, the king Shaka a nation down the sort of east coast of South Africa in the 1820s. All right, we're going to head back towards Juma now and see what's on offer there. I've had enough of fighting with the game drive radio over here. Minnesota, thank you. You've just seen Scott drive through a dry river bed, and you say, are there any flowing rivers here in the Sabi Sands? Yes, there are, absolutely. Uh, there is one, it's called the Sand River, that flows through the middle, and then the southern boundary of the Sabi Sands is the Sabi River, and that flows permanently. I suspect the Sand River came very close to drying out this year. 
and I'm pretty sure it's flowing now. Uh, it does, it's about sort of four kilometers to the south of us, so we don't actually ever see it here when, when we're on Juma. But I certainly used to work on the banks of the Sand River when I was at Londolozi. And then there's another big river that does run through here called the Manileti. It doesn't flow, but it's, it's, it obviously flowed for a long time, many years back. It's very wide and sand, sandy with huge trees uh, on the banks, uh, just an enormous river. It will flow permanently under the under the surface, but not on top of the surface. And uh, Jerry, sitting in Johannesburg. Hello, Gerald. Um, Geraldine uh, says it's not storming there yet. Well, Jerry, I hope you have a storm this afternoon. Bat-eared fox. Now, for those of you who don't know, bat-eared fox is a canid, so it's one part of the dog family that has these enormous ears. And what it does is it, it listens for termites and ant nests under the ground. So it puts its head against the ground, the ears flap onto the ground, and it listens for its prey under the ground. But Cindy, they're in the desert areas, um, up sort of north onto the highfield, into the Kalahari, and into Namibia. That's where you see bat-eared foxes. Wonderful animals. Thank you, Cindy. I suppose the closest we'd get here would be a jackal, a side-striped jackal. We don't see them very often. I'm not really sure why. Certainly in some areas of the Kruger National Park, they're all over the place. some tracks here and evidence of elephants where they've broken trees all over the place. I believe Scott also has something with big ears on his, uh, on his vehicle. I don't think he's referring to Brian. Let's go and see what it is. Well, this isn't a sight we get to see very often. I, oh, and that's exactly why the scrub hairs don't hang around during the day and they are predominantly nocturnal. They lie up in shallow scrapes under thick bushes during the day. Sometimes you flush them when you're walking, but you typically don't see too much of them in the daylight. Wonderful. My friend Matty. Good to know you're watching. And Matty's interested to know if there are any snakes in this area that will make a rattling sounds similar to a rattlesnake, which has got tiny little shakers, you could say, at the end of its tail, right at the end of its tail segment, that it lets that it vibrates and lets off a rattling noise, as I'm sure a lot of the American audience will know. Matty, there aren't any snakes that I know of that will rattle, but they will make noises other ways. The puff adder, which is quite a similar snake to the rattlesnake, will hiss. So that's why it's called a puff adder, because it literally puffs up, and then as it blows out, it makes that hissing noise. And you also get some snakes, the egg eater is one of them, that will rub its scales against one another, which kind of makes a hissing noise but it's doing it not by exhaling like the puff adder, but by rubbing its scales together. I can't think of any other snakes that make noises in South Africa, though. There could well be some that I don't know of, but nothing quite like the rattlesnake. But the adders, which are similar looking, very similar snakes, will, like I say, often hiss and blow themselves up. Still on the topic of snakes, Pamela's wondering if we get black mambas here, and we certainly do, Pamela. 
I uh, haven't seen any this snake season, but last summer we had about three or four sightings, I think, just on my vehicle. Um, so, Brian, when did you see yours with James recently? A couple of weeks ago. Uh, Brian saw one with James. We were just chatting about that earlier. Brian said he was horrified at the speed at which that snake could move. And it was a big one, two meters plus. They get to around three meters, the massive black mambas, about that thick. Ooh. And Nikki seems to think that Peter Pretorius may have bumped into a black mamba while he was here recently. So there are about, but sadly, we just don't see as many snakes as we would like to. find our way around out here. Vicky from Chicago has asked, are there any signboards that help you with directions? And not really, no, Vicky. It's mainly just trees and scenery that you look for to help you understand which road is which. Obviously, there are maps which map out all the individual road names. And we've got a very nice app on all of our phones that is a mobile GPS that tells us exactly where we are on these relevant maps. So we do have aid, but it is, it is a bit of a time-consuming affair learning all the different alleys that run through this wilderness, because everything does look quite similar in the beginning. And on cloudy days and at night, that's when you can get really lost when you don't have the sun or the stars to help you with direction. Every tree that I see birds fly out of now, I check carefully for nests. I just saw a laughing dove fly out of that tree back there. Um, Julie Bennett, good evening, good to have you with us. Would like to know if we live here at Juma or if we go off and stay elsewhere. And at the moment, Julie, we are living here at Juma. The crew is split up into two different areas of accommodation. And basically the couples stay out at house. Look at how beautiful this is. And Eugene is the oldest member of our crew. So it's two couples at one house and one singleton, Eugene, or one of our tech wizards. And then the rest of the crew stay in smaller rooms and that's where we do all of our kind of camp stuff, all of our eating and meetings uh, at what is called the DRC, the Juma Research Camp. And there's about 10 bedrooms there, which are not full at the moment. Aren't these clouds spectacular? Thanks, Brian, for taking us on this aerial adventure. Not too much out to the north, which is where we're looking now. And as Brian continues across to the east, you'll see it starts to get a lot darker to the south and east. And that's the storm that narrowly missed us. Skirted past it. A little bit tiring. And who knows what next year will hold. But good prospects at this stage. mother of the leopard that you spent the afternoon with is going to pop up. It's been quite some time since we've last seen her. It's been nice to get a grip of where she is.
James has bumped into quite an interesting specimen and we are going to take you across for a quick hello. Well, look at that everybody, look what we found. Hi folks, how you doing? Great to see you, we just thought we'd drop in. Got my family and friends here, which has been the most incredible thing to have after Safari Live, after Big Cat Week, which is outrageous. Normally, I jump on a plane, end up sitting in Joburg by myself, watching these guys doing an incredible job, and then fly home, of course, to my beautiful wife and son. But this has been a really fantastic sort of up the mountain, beautiful peak with Big Cat Week and all the incredible times we had. Plateau, having a little break, and then they arrived, and it's just been fantastic. So we've been at Juma, we've seen you guys going live as we've been watching you live which has been fantastic and uh thank you for all the support and love that you've sent uh, to all the friends and family that's for sure just uh, talk us through your first game drive first morning game drive <laughs> what did you have my, there my first okay. morning game drive with these with your family this is not bragging i promise you but it, it, this is these are the sorts of things that happen now and again uh the first morning game drive with family and friends uh we saw cheetah we saw leopard not just Leopard, but Karula and Shadow interacting. <laughs> Sorry, did I say that out loud? My apologies. Karula and Shadow, uh, Cheetah, Salati male lions, uh, right, uh, elephant. Elephant. Big herds of elephants <laughs> and massive herds of buffalo and loads of other things. It's absolutely been brilliant, but miss you guys. <laughs> James Hendry. <laughs> Thank you, so Lucky. That's unbelievable. All right, we're going to uh, leave him to his uh, probably a gin and tonic. Excellent thing to be drinking at this time of the day. <laughs> Kids are not drinking that, of course. What are you having to drink? Gin and tonic. Oh, they are live. Right, let's get across to Scott before anything gets out of hand here, and we'll see you a bit later. <laughs> see you guys. See you soon. Well, I'm sure all of you enjoyed that surprise glimpse of the elusive Hayden Turner and isn't it wonderful that he's managed to spend some time here on a social level so very good stuff and glad that he's enjoying himself with his family and friends out here it really is a wonderful place to work but it's far more magical to be here with friends and family as I'm sure all of you would understand I think it is time to drive Ingwe Alley, which is a road that has kind of been built since Safari Live's return to this area. Good evening, Tiki. And Tiki is wondering, how long did I train to do this job? Well, Tiki, it was very, very easy, actually. I just did a six-month training course at a lodge nearby in the southern Sabi Sands. And then I was a fully-fledged guide with all the national uh, legal qualifications that I required. And obviously, I was an absolute rookie because I had no experience driving guests around and dealing with guests on safari but after six months of hardcore training i had a fairly decent knowledge of the basics out here and since then i've just been adding to my experience and knowledge day by day so it's not difficult to become a field guide that's for certain Obviously, taking six guests on the back of your vehicle is an entirely different scenario to what we're doing now, presenting a live stream safari. Um, so, different, but very similar in many respects. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a true safari experience, which I feel it really is, the interaction between all of us and the moments and memories that we share together are fantastic but it is obviously different having thousands of people on a safari as opposed to six so you can cater for individually and get to know over a three-day period it's a little bit more tricky to get to know you guys individually 
Although some of the longer term viewers have built up relationships with us and we've got to kind of understand what makes various people tick. Ticky. Very good. And it's something very important to remember whether you are boy or girl, young or old, it is not an impossibility to come out and do a training course and work out here. So remember to keep that dream alive if it is one. Lodgers actually quite often enjoy employing ex-lawyers or ex-accountants. So if you are a lawyer and accountant wanting to do something different, that would bode well on your CV. interesting question from Rich King and Rich King would like to know what is the largest animal that's ever jumped onto this vehicle with me huh probably a large beetle I guess um, no mammals that I can think of and Thankfully, no reptiles have jumped on board either. I have heard a few horror stories of people off-roading and snakes getting bumped off trees into the, a moving vehicle, usually in a predator sighting. So imagine following a pride of lion and then a boom slung or another venomous snake falls into your vehicle. Where do you go? Into the lion or on the vehicle with the snake? I guess you can do the maths and work out your own calculations there. Um, but no, nothing serious, Rich King. I've heard of another horror story of a giraffe falling into a vehicle that was being brought down by lions. And if I remember that story correctly, I think it may have even been a fatal fall onto the vehicle and some people lost their lives. So you do hear the occasional horror story, but I guess that is the planet we live on. You get these kind of freak disasters that happen from time to time. But usually the animals stay away from us here. Yeah? I know in certain parts of Masai Mara there and the Serengeti or various reserves where you see cheetah, they will use the vehicles as vantage points. And obviously that is something that would be very fun, but I'm on the kind of outlook that it should be prevented and you should just animals in the vehicle that's not likely to attack, to attack us as a human you're just allowing them to kind of over human animal boundary evening james go ahead i'm told james was looking for me on the radio but now as i try to contact him no response just wanting to know where I'm working. Um, the two roads that I haven't driven yet on Juma are Aubrey's Road and Hyena Road. Other than that, I've basically done everything. update you on his plans and I think that is to possibly head to the hyena den. Good stuff, see you later. Well, we are back everybody and Scott Dyson being psychic has predicted correctly. We're going to try and see if we can find something at the hyena den. I think it's going to be particularly interesting to see what this uh, virtual reality rig is able to pick up in a place like the hyena den. So that's where we're going at the moment. Uh, very nice to see old HT on the safari. He heads back, unfortunately, to the UK tomorrow. It really has just been a wonderful experience having him around here and having the, the old hands. 
teach us their, old, their tricks. The important part of guiding, the whole guiding experience, is having mentors. too far away, Andrew, if you wouldn't mind pointing your camera at the eastern horizon there. You just get an idea of the kind of cloud that seems to have left a vortex of clarity above us, but it's dumping its rain everywhere else in the Kruger Park, and we just went past Taxon, and who was driving Hayden, and he says that his house in Acorn Hook, which is where that storm was blowing down, um, has done some serious damage to his house. No hail, thankfully. Uh, but lots of wind and I suspect given the, the state of some of the roofing in that area I suspect it's probably pulled the roof off his house and you know lots of people there to help so it'll be okay it's obviously a very very big storm they had out in April so we're just going past quarantine clearings now Uh, you want me to find your cheetah because Hayden saw one? I'll do my best, Janice. Uh, give me three minutes. Go and check out a Wahlberg's Eagle with Scott, and um, I'll, we'll, we'll show you a cheetah when you get back. So, here we have a Wahlberg's Eagle. We are very close to it, and I think this is possibly the closest I've ever been to one with all of you. This is a pale form, so it's slightly lighter than normal, but they are usually a kind of a chocolatey brown color. Interestingly, the pair that nest in this area are both pale. Look at this long talons there on the branch it's perched on. Great view of those. I'm glad Janet jumped at the opportunity to figure out that Brent is, in fact, the answer to Rich King's question a bit earlier, the largest animal to jump into this vehicle. And I think you're right, it'll be a close tie between Brent and Brian, though. They are two of the larger individuals on our crew. Okay, well, we're going to send you back to James. I hope you enjoyed that little view of the Wahlbergs. Well, I was just reminiscing with my old pal Andrew here about the, uh, the amazing sighting we had during Big Cat Week of Mpula. Very lucky. We were on our way to the hyena den. Saw three hyenas on the road, and we're just sitting there. Uh, marveling at the site and then three minutes later looked up and there was Mbula in the tree trying to escape the hyenas. It doesn't often happen like that, but what an amazing privilege when it does, especially during Big Cat Week. I mean, the ultimate objective, of course, is to find Andrew. Big cats. Yes, big cats. Janet, I'm very sorry, we didn't find a cheetah. Um, like, um, without being facetious, this is really not ideal cheetah habitat. It is woodland area, and cheetahs do prefer more open areas where they can course, they can run fast after their prey. Here, it's not easy, and I remember an incident at Londolozi once where a cheetah actually disemboweled itself. It was running so fast, you know, they go at such a speed, and it jumped over a fallen log or something that an elephant had pushed over, and that cut out the cheetah's belly, and it actually disemboweled itself. So that's generally why they don't like this area too much. So not a very nice story. I think they actually managed to, it's happened twice, I think they managed to save one of the cheetahs. cheetahs and you want to know why it is that uh, the oh look who's here eric i'll get back to your question 
We have a, what's known as a girl power safari going on here. <laughs> Look at that. Hello, Jamie. Hello. Look at that. Hello, James. Say hello, Jamie. Don't hello. go past without saying hello. You know, everybody does love you. Hello, everybody. Yes, this is, is Emma. Emma's hey, wonderful. Hello, Emma. Emma. Emma is wonderful. There we go. Emma is wonderful. Yeah. Good Fun. news. It's always important to go on safari with wonderful people. I, I, find, I feel the same way. Not idiots. You don't want to go with them. No, we'll try to. Right. Work. As you were. All which right. side is best, do you think? Right. Normal side. Yep, okay. normal side. Enjoy. Enjoy your drive. Thank you. Enjoy. Cheers. See you just now. <laughs> <laughs> you can't move. That was Jamie. It's such a privilege, I tell you what, having a lady on the front, on the team. And as I said yesterday, the cub is out. I didn't say that yesterday. As I said yesterday, the real advantage to having ladies on guiding and ranging teams is that their egos tend to be so much smaller than the men. And that means that they don't push animals too hard. They don't. Um, they don't act in a macho fashion out in the bush, which is wonderful. They teach us all a lesson every day. Exactly. They're not cowboys. Well, I did see the cow. Andrew, where'd it go? Let's just stop here for a little bit. I hope that it's just gone the other side there. We'll go across there if the little thing doesn't move up here. I saw it leaping about on the top of the mound. Anyway, while we're doing that, I'll just answer that question about the cheetahs and why it is they've got that white mantle on the back of the of cheetah cubs, why they've got that white mantle on their backs. That's Andrew turning on the VR rig. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and the reason they have that white mantle, we think, everybody, is that they look a little bit like honey badgers when they're little and i think maybe it just puts off predators slightly predators don't like honey badgers honey badgers are voracious defenders of themselves and their cubs and i think that that white mantle perhaps makes them look a little bit like honey badgers and that could be why they are colored like that i also think it makes it easier for them to lie down in the grass and hide if they're threatened I'm going to sit here for another two minutes. Oh, there's the six-month-old cub. There, you can see the, her back. But I think the little one is probably with her. Let's sit here for another two minutes, and then we'll move around that side and see if we can't see the, the black cub. Jamie was sitting right where we are, and she said the cub was around here. Dr. Debbie, um, we've heard these hyenas going, uh, heard the little one going, tick, 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 tick. and you want to know what the strangest noise that I've heard an animal make is. Um, Dr. Debbie, I think that the most bizarre noise that I've heard uh, probably comes from a hippo. Hippos make the most astonishing noises when they're threatened or when they're trying to mate. They've got this kind of, I'm not going to do it here because it will cre create great consternation at the den, but this kind of loud, this groaning noise. Uh, it sounds like it comes from another world entirely. Yeah. No, it's not. It's the nose. Um, yeah, so Dr. Debbie, I'd say hippos are probably the ones that make the most the strange noise for me. What about you, Andrew? What's An ostrich makes a very strange noise. An ostrich does make an odd noise, yes. Or a bird. Yes. It's almost like a roar. All right, I think we're going to go around the other side there. Let's see if we can get a slightly better look of the cub. If we can't, we'll just come straight back to this area and wait patiently. Ooh, I'm in two minds. What the mother does. It's the 
the most perfect den site. There's lots of shade, huge termite mound for safety. Positioning here. Now you want to know by this in its sleep like a dog does. Uh, Rich, I haven't. I've no doubt they dream. Sorry, you lost me there. Uh, Rich King, uh, a wonderful question. Have I ever seen hyenas running in their sleep like dogs? Rich, I haven't. I've no doubt they do dream though, in much the same way that dogs and cats do. There we go. High action now. There's the little one. Well, I don't know what's going on here. They will often have more than one entrance to the hole. So maybe she's got another little hole in there. Maybe she's just playing around. Look at the little thing. Exploring the world. So sweet. <laughs> and that six month old will just be at the edge of suckling. Stopping almost weaned. And so we'll start to have to move around a bit with the clan. This little thing has got another five months or so of suckling on. Look at it. Too precious. <laughs> and every single time I see her, she looks like she's just getting a little bit more sure-footed. The lessons of running around on this mound are helping to solidify the neural bonds in her nervous system and help to strengthen the muscles that she's going to need as an adult hyena. And every single time I see her, she ventures just a little bit further down the mound. Look at that. There you can hear the mother going, I'm chewing there. So sweet. <laughs> and you can just feel a change in the atmosphere now. Everything around us is starting to calm down. The birds of the day have stopped singing, and we're into the changing of the guard. And just to keep you informed, we won't put a light on them, but, I mean, these days it's been staying light to almost seven o'clock, so we wouldn't need to anyway. But these little ones are just a little bit too small just don't want to have any effect on their possible survival through putting lights on them. <laughs> so sweet. You can feel the atmosphere. It's such a lovely atmosphere now. The cicadas are still going. And there's just, it just feels like the earth has taken a sigh and breathed out.
Uh, hyenas will move their dens every so often. Uh, these ones haven't moved now for probably five weeks. And the whole clan, I think, will make the decision to move when the time comes. This little one was actually born in here. And we don't know if this, how many cubs this mother has had and, you know, how long they will be in this den. So I don't know. You know, I would say if they are going to move, it'll be pretty soon. They will need to avoid the disease that comes along. But it won't be just that mother that decides where to move the den because obviously the mother of the six-month-old cub will have a vested interest in where they go and where they stay, depending on who the matriarch is. We think maybe the mother of the six-month-old is the matriarch, although Brent said he didn't think so the other day. He saw she's got a big scar on her back, so she's easily identifiable. He thought maybe, or he thought he'd seen her being dominated by one or two others. Interestingly, just talking about first-time mothers, which I, I think this one's a little bit old to be a first-time mother, but first-time mother hyenas, 18% of them will die in childbirth because of that very odd arrangement of genitalia that they have. And of those, of those 18% or, and the rest of them, a lot of the cubs will die as well. So although 18% of mothers die in childbirth, uh, higher proportion, I think it's almost 40% of cubs born to first-time mothers will die. And for those of you who don't know, they've got a really odd kind of birth tract. The uterus is in the same place as it would be in any other sort of similarly shaped animal. But the fetus has got to come out of a um, sort of uh, <clears throat> telescopically inverted a pseudo penis or a large clitoris, which is just, um, you know, it makes for an extremely awkward birthing process. Now, Tammy, you're obviously looking at the two different colors and wondering when the spots come. And um, they'll start pretty soon. You can see completely spotted at six months, that one there almost seven months I suppose but she was spotted by six months and so this little one will start to get spots the more and more time she spends outside already around the face she's getting a little bit of spotting around the neck look 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 how close she's coming isn't that wonderful this is the first time she's been this close to the car on her own the mother's watching quite carefully it's so sweet but you can there very clean, clearly see the spotting Tammy starting on the neck. It's Andrew just uh, turning on the VR rig. He's calling him back. safari there was a wild dog cub called teddy and you want to know if we've managed to keep up with teddy um jenny i have certainly never heard of a, a hyena look, look look she's coming so close never heard of a hyena called teddy once they get to adult though it's very difficult to follow the individuals look how close this is fantastic she's taking the little one on a little walk giving andrew the hairy eyeball Oh, this is fantastic. This is just so special. I think they'll go straight back up the other side. <laughs> you can hear her calling. Ooh, she sat down to suckle there, just below the den. It's, I'm just going to reverse back a bit. Try and get a decent view in there. Wonderful stuff. This is incredible. 
So I don't know what happened to Teddy, but Jenny, it's very difficult to tell. Teddy could well be still around. Difficult to tell with the adults. Uh, we don't spend nearly as much time with them as we do with the leopards and lions. So to pick individuals from the clan, and especially if Teddy were, had, was a male, you know, he wouldn't be, he wouldn't necessarily be in the same clan. Oh, Cub's coming back this way. Thank you, Andrew. This is fantastic. I don't know where to look. causes them to die the first time mothers and is it blood loss? Jeffrey, I don't know what it is, you know. Um, I think it's internal injury. The fetus has basically got to do a 90 degree turn internally and then come out of this ridiculously shaped organ that um, doesn't look like it was ever designed to birth something. And I think that the internal injuries that result, I couldn't tell you what those are, uh, are the leading causes of deaths for young hyena mothers. I'm actually just going to wait here for a little while. and very pertinent, brilliant question. Why, if it is so harmful uh, to the hyenas, you know, why do they have that anatomy that makes it harmful to them? Well, Monique, I'm going to take it back to human beings. For many, many, many years, until the advent of medical science and advanced obstetrics, of course, one of the greatest dangers to a woman was giving birth. And that's because our hips are placed where they are, um, and that birthing canal goes between the hips as opposed to out the back of them, as happens with most other mammals. And that makes birthing much less dangerous for them. That is simply because we are bipedal, we walk upright, and it's one of the sacrifices we've made to being bipedal. The birth canal is very narrow, especially for our youngsters, which have enormous heads. Um, so, Monique, in the case of the hyena, and I've just read about this. It, they reckon that it's just, it's a, the reason they, they, you know, they have this highly matriarchal social society uh, where the females, in order to maintain the social so structure that, that they have, have this en enormous amount of androgen uh, or various androgens, different kinds of male sex hormones that give them all these male sex characteristics. And the, one of the sort of the costs of that of these strange male organs that they have, one of the costs involved is this dangerous birth process. And I don't, it obviously, evolutionary wise, it obviously hasn't affected their numbers sufficiently for there to be enough selective pressure for them to have a different design or for nature to come up with a different design. And so, yeah, it's just one of the, the, the trade-offs that they have to, for maintaining this incredibly successful social structure that they have. Great question, Monique. Thank you. And I'm more than happy if you wish to discuss stuff like that again. And if you've got any more questions on it, let's think it through together. I'll just try and go around the other side now. I think the default is going to be for the cub to come more towards the side. And um, the reason we call a hyena baby a cub as opposed to a pup is that they are not dogs. They are not related to the wild dogs at all. This is and this, the wild dogs are part of the dog family, the canids. They're in a family all their own, but it's much more closely related to the felidae or the cats than it is to the canidae or the dogs. So that's, they, although they look like dogs, well, they look on the surface like dogs. They're not actually very closely related to dogs at all. Gracie, you want to know <laughs> when a 
little hyena will be able to laugh like its mother. You've obviously heard hyenas laughing. <laughs> I've heard it's trying. I've heard that little thing going. And that's the start of it beginning to laugh, Gracie. And so only when it's about the same age as the other six month old cub that's here will it be able to laugh nicely. And probably even after that, maybe only after a year. the cubs learning to clean itself rich it's interesting you know hyenas are not fastidious cleaners like the cats um, so I don't think there's a huge amount of effort to put into personal hygiene look at this thing it's getting so close now it's only about hmm, I'd say about eight feet away from us look at that. so rich no I don't think there's a huge amount of sort of hygiene training that goes into it. Look, 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 look. Oh dear. Don't bite the camera. So I did just kick my, my earpiece out, so I missed the last question, but it'll come through again. Now, the cub is noticing the little red lights on the top of that, <laughs> on the top of the virtual reality rig. It does look slightly alien. Andrew, I think we might have to do something about those lights. Look at that. Fascinated by it. And it's just very slightly different from the normal, you know. The adult isn't affected at all. This one looks like it wants to jump up and have a bite. It'll be an expensive meal. So Debbie in New Jersey, you've just tuned in and you heard me waffling on about disease around the hyena den and you'd want me to explain a bit more what i mean debbie is that because they're in the hole there and um, there will inevitably be a buildup of disease just like there is in a wild dog den or a cat den because the cub will be basically going to the toilet inside the hole there sometimes and, and because there's no sort of cleaning out of the den she will eventually make it smelly and sort of attract diseases. And so that hole will eventually become a, a sort of, I don't know, become a, a sort of a, what's the right word? It'll become an incubator of diseases because of the different kinds of nutrients that will be brought in there through, they'll probably drag with some pieces of dead stuff down there, go to the loo down there, and that won't be very good for the health of the hyena baby. So that's why they'll move. Also, if they're threatened, so if lions come around here and they come, keep coming past the area, they will definitely look going inside now because the adult has left. Or thinking about going inside, doesn't want to be outside if mum's not here. There the adults are. I think they're going off to forage, you know. Well, that's the six month old, that's not the adult. They are still there. There we go. Oh, wonderful question from Deborah in Johannesburg. Um, in the lions, there's a lot of what we call cross-suckling, where lions will cross-suckle each other, and if the you know if a lioness dies, if there's another lioness of sufficient age or the right age and the right state of, of lactation, uh, she will feed the other cubs. That does not happen with hyenas. They do not cross-suckle. They don't cross-suckle their cubs at all. And so if this mother was to die, I think it would probably be tickets for the little cub.
James, very nice question all the way from Oklahoma. Brilliant name that you have. Uh, possibly the best name in the world. Uh, James, you want to know about males in hyena society and do they ever run the, the show? James, there is not more downtrodden in the world than the male of a hyena clan. He is smaller than the females. He is dominated. Even, even males born to the matriarch will eventually end up at the bottom of the pecking order. None of them outrank females as adults. Then what? So they never run the pack at all. They never may play any part in administration um, or government. Uh, and I don't mean that entirely facetiously. They really play no leadership role in the clan at all. And interestingly, if they want a mate, they, they also have a hierarchy, a very definite hierarchy amongst the males. But if a male wants to mate, he will normally have to leave his natal clan and go to another clan. And if he does do that, if he is adopted by another clan, his status will be right at the very bottom rung. Now, what happens with, if you're born into a clan like this and you have a bit of status, interestingly, only 4% of hyena babies are born to males born in that clan. In other words, you, if you're a high-ranking male, you can maintain your status if you want, but the chances of your leaving a genetic legacy, actually breeding, are extremely slim indeed. But if you're prepared to sacrifice your social status and go to another clan, then you will be able to breed. Now, I don't know of another animal, any mammal, anywhere in the world where that happens. It's normally completely the opposite. It's the males of higher status that, that mate, and those that are of low status do not mate. And that goes from human beings to chimpanzees to squirrels to lions, I suspect to dolphins. Well, I don't know that for sure. I expect it just about every single other mammal that I can think of. So if you can tell me another society in where males of lower status are more likely to breed than those of higher status, I'd be fascinated. Anne in Texas, a lovely question. I really enjoy discussing these little, these complex topics to which there are no obvious answers. You want to know, do I think evolution will ever improve the sort of birthing rate? Um, Anne, whether it's mechanically possible for them to maintain the important kind of this false male genitalia that they have and have a birthing canal that is less dangerous, I don't know. Were it mechanically possible, and were that mutation to suddenly occur, absolutely. Over time, we would find that those with safer births were birthing canals were selected for. I'm not sure that that selective pressure exists, though. It's the same as with human beings. I'm not sure that human beings, well, especially with obstetrics now, uh, there's certainly no disadvantage to having narrow hips anymore. Um, I'm not sure that human beings would ever change. Um, you know, for hundreds of thousands of years, many women died giving birth because our hips are, you know, our birthing canals between the hips. Great question. Thank you for that. You know, getting a couple of spits of rain now. So. Right, Chantel, you are just 12 years old and you're homeschooling. Wonderful, I hope you're enjoying this. What a great biology lesson, I suppose this must be. Live in Africa, brilliant stuff. We're happy to give you whatever information you need and keep asking us questions. Everybody, we're gonna have to pull out of the sighting. It's getting dark and it is starting to rain and that VR rig on the front of the car is now going to become wet, so we're going to have to pull that off. All right, let's head across to Scott quickly, and uh, he'll say goodbye to you, and I'll see you in just a little while. Bye-bye, hyenas. Thank you for a wonderful afternoon. Sounds like a wonderful sighting at the den. Good news. Brian and myself 
parked in a set spot and just listened for about 10 or 15 minutes whilst Brian attempted to capture some lightning bolts to the south and we sadly didn't share any alarm calls or signs from the bushel which may have helped us to track down Karula or any leopards or anything interesting happening. Any predators really will be alarmed at, maybe even a python that may have caught an impala lamb. It does happen. So our silent moments of silence was fruitless, but we have now just started driving again and hoping that the spotlight may help unveil something interesting. news that I've heard over the radio waves, a female leopard called Inkanyeni, who I've e never actually seen before. I've seen her two cubs from a previous litter, Shiluva and Makombo, on one or two occasions. Either way, this female leopard, Inkanyeni, has got two tiny cubs. They've been seen for the first time, I think, this afternoon. They may have seen, been seen before, but it's the first time I've heard of it. And isn't that wonderful news? The catch is, is that in Kanyeni doesn't spend time on our property, but that could change. And who knows, maybe we'll get lucky and she'll bring her little cubs across to Juma for a visit. We haven't had any good leopard cub sightings since I've arrived, which has been a year now. So it'll be really great if we can change that. But good to know that two new leopard cubs are in the Sabi Sands, and for now they're doing well. I must warn everyone in advance that even if we may not get attached to these two cubs in specific, we could well come across another two cubs, maybe the cubs of Shadow or Karula in the future. But sadly, the mortality rate with leopard cubs and lion cubs is very high. So it's important to remember that the odds are stacked against them. And as cute and adorable as they are, Remember, it's important to try to remember to not get too attached. Anyway, that's the good news I thought I'd share with you. I wonder when Karula is going to give birth next to her next. Her last cubs that were known of were kind of December, January, early, early this year. So she's long overdue giving birth again. She sadly lost the final cub of that litter to a hyena. As you can see, the beautiful skyline continues this afternoon and has graced us with some incredible views. The entire safari from this moment we headed out until now, which is wonderful. It's not always about the animals, although you did get spoiled with some good sightings of James, less so on this vehicle, but just the scenery that we got to experience was Quite marvellous and a very pleasant afternoon to be out exploring. Oh, let's maybe stop here. There's a bolt of lightning that I just saw. And if Brian just zooms in a little bit straight more in there, that's where the last bolt was. So you're perfect there, Brian, I think. And let's hope another bolt comes down in the next few seconds before I say goodbye, or as I say my goodbyes, rather. Come on, one more big bolt of lightning. There was, oh, there's a little bit of lightning behind the clouds that you could see there. Okay, well, no luck with the lightning, but thank you very much for joining in on the safari, and we will see you tomorrow. Well, you, at least you will see Brent and Jamie out tomorrow morning. Over to James. <laughs> ah, 
Yes, well, you saw me very elegantly climbing to the top here so that I may be backlit by the beauty of the African sunset. Thank you, everybody, for a wonderful show, wonderful questions, so nice to have interactions like we have had with you. So please keep them coming like that. Big thank you to Andrew, back on camera, not drone commandering all over the place, thanks to Nikki and Kirsty in the final control, and to Scott and Brian on the other vehicle. We will see you tomorrow. Hopefully in the golden light of the African dawn. Bye-bye. See you then.